Lily to ask me. And I was like, I mean, I'm all. Oh my god, that's hot. <clears throat> okay. I can't lie, I'm like nervous to do this because my doggy. You wanna go outside? I'm actually really nervous to do this because I feel like it's gonna be a long video. I haven't spoken to you in a while. All the books that I read from January to March are we ready i'm personally no i'm not ready that seems like a lot of books to cover in one video um 24 actually but i did see pato do a video that was like 25 books and then this morning i watched nathan answering basically a hundred questions so i was like you can do this <laughs> okay so everything i read from January to March, we have 24 books. I'm going to be brief because it's a lot of books to do in one video, but also my mind is a sieve, so I will just be brief because I can't really remember a lot of what I read back at the start of the year. I only have some of the books here. Um, most of them are at my flat. I'm at my boyfriend's flat just now, but I do have a small pile of books here. So we started the year with Small Things Like These by Claire Keegan. I really like this slim little baby. It is based in a small town in Ireland. And I think that if you're really interested in like community as a character and like the morals of the community become questioned by something on the outside then I feel like you'd probably like this book so we follow our protagonist is a middle-aged man he has a wife at home he has children at home it's in the run-up to Christmas and yeah, Claire Keegan really sets the scene. It feels very uh, small town, very cold, um, very working class, very trying to make sure that your kids have a lovely Christmas, even though um, there maybe isn't much to go around. Now, our protagonist, um, while he's out at work, sees something that troubles him a little bit, and he happens to come across one of the Magdalene laundries, um, which historically... Um, were very horrid places for young women who were pregnant and also just young women who didn't act accordingly, that were difficult or hard to handle, were often sent to Magdalene laundries um, and they would be, you know, kept there by the church and the protagonist comes across one of these young women and they're not doing so well and so he... Um, I don't want to give the entire story away because it is very short, but basically this man has to come up against what is morally right and what's morally expected and is it better to do what is expected and risk rocking the boat or to just go along with the community's kind of standards and um, pretend that we don't know what's going on behind walls and um, behind doors that are closed to us and oh I've got something in my eye. Yeah, I feel like there was a lot of feeling in such a small book and if you're in like a reading slump, I feel like this would be a good one to get you out of it. It really kickstarted my year. Following on from that, we had The Things They Fancied by Molly Young. This was um, emailed to me as a PDF by Molly Young. It was kind of like a zine, so I don't know if it technically counts in the books that I've read this year, but I'm gonna give it to you anyway because I really, really loved it. So Molly Young is based in New York. She is a writer and a journalist and just really, really witty, really clever, loves deep research. And last year I read another one of her zines, um, 
Sleepy Hollow Motor Inn by her and it was all about kind of like motels and motel life and um, it, I really loved it and then she also sent me the PDF of the things they fancied. Now this was like a deep historical dive into the upper classes and the things they fancied and just the kind of uh, history of where these kind of elite fanciful things that the upper classes enjoy come from. Um, really quick read, really enjoyable, um, kind of just like wacky history and learning where things that rich people like came from. <laughs> I'm missing a book. I definitely looked another one out. Hang on a second, let me go find it. Okay, I just had a quick look at the list and realized that I have quite a few more of the books that I read here. Um, so after Molly Young, I read Sleepless Nights by Elizabeth Hardwick and I really, really love this cover. Um, and I can't say I loved this book, but there were some beautiful sentences in it. It's, it was first published in 79, I think, and it's like a fictional autobiography and it's very kind of like fragmented and you just get glimpses of this woman's life and the loves that she has had and the places that she's traveled and how they've brought her into being the person that she is. Um, yeah, there were some gorgeous lines in here. Um, let me find a couple. Okay, so for example, um, it had two rooms. I stepped into them with the feeling of falling into a well of disgrace. That tender warning word, disgrace, I carried about with me for years and years. It has its reasonable scolding power over me still. It freezes that radical heart with lashing whispers. So nice. Yeah, so um, I didn't love, love, love it. It was enjoyable. Um, but yeah, I think I would describe this as like a fictional autobiography. Um, almost like putting the pieces together of why this woman is who she is. Okay, next I did a audiobook and it was Eileen by Otessa Moshfeg. So I have only read My Year of Rest and Relaxation by Moshfeg and I liked it. I don't think I loved it, but I did like it and I thought about it a lot afterwards. I've read some of Moshfeg's other writing online and I do like her style. Um, but yeah, I think doing this on audio was actually a really good idea because the narrator was great. I feel like from what I've read of Moshveg so far, from my year of rest and relaxation and her online writing, she's very, very good at capturing the essence of like one person um, really well and like giving you the lens that they see the world through. So Eileen follows this young woman through a very um, like difficult part of her life. Although to be fair, it sounds like her entire life has been quite difficult, but um, she's lost her mother. She's staying with her um, alcoholic ab abusive father and she's working in the office at a correctional facility for young men. And the way that Moshveg manages to capture the coldness, the darkness, the kind of like grunginess and um, like dirtiness that um, is all over her life is like really, really fascinating. There's this young woman who is just so absorbed with disgust and is disgusted at herself, but kind of loves the disgust that comes with it. And I found Eileen a fascinating protagonist. I really, really enjoyed really enjoyed her and so she's living her life with her abusive father in the office of this correctional facility and um a woman comes to work there who's slightly older than her and is a therapist i think it's been a while since i listened to it she's a therapist and eileen becomes obsessed with her and the story kind of um goes on along the path of these two women and how different they are but how they come together and how then it all unravels um yeah i loved it i think it's being adapted into a film with anne hathaway and yeah i'm really looking forward to seeing that okay next we have 
The God of Small Things by Arundhati Roy. Um, this, I would say, is definitely a departure from what I usually read. Um, it was not first person protagonist at all. This book is um, a masterclass in narrative structure. The book moves through time so fluidly, so seamlessly, going, projecting into the future and then going into the past and yeah, it follows a set of twins, um, Rahel and Esther, and their lives in Kerala, India. So you really see the most beautiful language being deployed to depict some absolutely heartbreaking, harrowing events, but also bring the uh, setting really to life. So I think a lot of people say that this is like a work of magical realism and I don't know if I fully agree with that. I feel like there's a certain use of language and very specifically the use of imagery can is just extremely vivid and it, at times very lyrical and also uncanny and that kind of imagery and language is used to um, explore like deep emotional, deep traumatic events. Narrative doesn't conform to like the traditional novel, the structure of it is incredibly well done. It flows into the future and into the past so seamlessly and I feel like even that speaks to how Roy is handling the theme of trauma within her work about how it can make you reflect on what's happened and then you carry it into the future and it's something that you still revisit and it's something that can change over time and it can change your character. There's a lot of intertextuality in this book as well which I feel like is really really clever. One phrase that is used a lot is Heart of Darkness and I mean that's the title of a novel by Joseph Conrad which speaks to the horrors of colonialism and throughout the book Roy's use of um, speech and language when it comes to the children like the twins as children um, is so magical the way that she's been able to capture how children form things in their head and the way that they speak them so Heart of Darkness um, the name of the novel um, by Joseph Conrad that comes up as a phrase quite a lot is then flipped and is uh, said of darkness of heart quite a lot and it refers to a specific place um, that they visit and yeah I just think that this book is so so beyond clever it's so intelligent it's structure it's use of imagery it's use of language the way that it can um, depict uh, family trauma trauma that arises from colonialism um, the boundaries within your family and how they get blurred and the love and hate that goes into that and just especially like having children as protagonists and being able to really capture the way that they speak and think like this is the best example that I have seen of that I absolutely loved this book and um, it's very harrowing and very upsetting so just be mindful of that if you do pick it up but for me it was absolutely worth it because it is a masterpiece. Then I read The Art of the Novel by Milan Kundera and I... it was fine, like I didn't love it, it didn't hook me, it was very much speaking about um, the history of the European novel as a whole, like the form historically, um, not so, not too much about his own writing practice and how he puts his novels together, which I kind of hoped a little bit more for, but it was like a deep dive into the history of mostly the European novel. And yeah, it was very um, full of information, some of it interesting, but I wasn't like, you know, so excited to get back to it after, you know, I'd gone about my day. I wasn't like, yes, I'm gonna make a cup of tea and read this book. I was like, okay, I'm gonna learn some history about the novel now. <laughs> and then I read, or I kind of finished, so I dipped into this last year and then came back to it and I just started it from the beginning again, Time as a Mother by Ocean Vuong. It was absolutely stunning. I loved it. 
I really, really love uh, Wong's writing a lot. I saw him speaking last year at the International Book Festival in Edinburgh, and he was speaking about this collection. And yeah, um, I don't really know what to say other than his poetry just does something for me. Um, so my favorite poem from this collection is Nothing, and it's a prose poem so it's just a slab of text and really speaks about um, being in the present moment and the history that has brought you to that present moment all the way down through your um, like your family lines and the person that you're with and their history and their family lines and how it's come to this moment that you're sharing together. I, I love that poem so much. Um, this is my boyfriend's copy, signed copy from Ocean. Uh, but yeah, um, this poetry collection is Ocean Vuong, uh, I guess, sitting with the grief of losing his mother and looking for a life in amongst that. It seems very intimate and very personal and just really, really, really beautiful. Okay, then I read more Jeanette Winterson. So I've only read Written on the Body and I read that last year and it was one of my favorite books. And I read Sex and the Cherry. This was a complete departure from Written on the Body. It was, it was just very different from anything that I've ever read. It was like historical fiction, but also felt very folklore-like or fairy tale like And yeah, that was interesting because it isn't what I expected. I remember reading the blurb and being like, oh, this is gonna be a ride. And it definitely was a ride. Um, it was all about, um, my guess is kind of just about love and desire and um, finding your own expression of that and what that means to you. Um, there is the kind of central relationship with a mother and a son and how they have different views of what they want for life, what she wants for him, what he wants for himself, um, her wanting to protect him and him wanting to go out and live his own life and find his true love and just this amazing, so his mother is this like amazing, massive woman who just looks down at men and is like, what do you think you can do to me? Like, think about what I'm about to do to you. She just has so much power in herself and it was really, really fun and interesting. Um, yeah, there's some stunning writing. I don't have my copy with me, it is at my flat. Um, but if you have read any Winterson and you liked it, then I would definitely urge you to read this. It is at my usual wheelhouse, I think, but very like refreshingly so. Then we had more poetry. I read Dunce by Mary Ruffle and I ate it up. This is such a good collection. It is mysterious and playful and is about death and then looking at um, how much life we have to live given that we are all kind of, you know, barreling towards death and that we should, you know, take these insignificant moments and inject them with meaning and it's just so like invigorating. I loved it. I've seen the dog straining at leashes in search of her. Her perfume is death, a black silhouette. In May, she straightens up, shortcuts through the hotel lobby, losing her scarf, which was strangling her. And then I lost her, but wait. Summer, my God, here she comes, floating on air. I can only imagine what she's been through, reeking like that of gardenia. Love. <laughs> Night falls and the empty intimacy of the whole world fills my heart to frothing. Fills my heart to frothing. Oh, so good. The past has trudged this one spot with a flashlight in its mouth and falls into the stream. Ancient tears beneath the surface rise and scatter like carp, while an, while an ivory hairpin floats away like a loose tooth going back in time. Yeah, I, I love this. There's just this sense of, I know I've said the word before, but the imagery is like really, really playful, even though it's about quite uh, heavy themes like death and grief and sorrow. There's also like the dichotomy of like life and love and enjoyment. And yeah, I, 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 I love this way more than I thought I was going to, to be honest. Um, my boyfriend picked this up for me 
couple of years ago, I think it was a couple of years ago now, when he was down in London and I've said this before, but if somebody recommends me a book or buys me a book or lends me a book, it usually takes me a while to get to it and it's not because I'm like, oh, that doesn't look good, but just because I'm such a mood reader and I have to wait for like the right moment to pick up and I definitely picked this up at the right moment and I'm so glad because it just made me really happy reading these poems. Then I did another audiobook. Um, I listened to Women Talking by Miriam Taze. And again, this was like a really good audio pick. <laughs> the narrator had such a gorgeous voice. This book's about a Mennonite colony and there has been if you hear weird noises, it's because my dog is eating his paws, okay? Um, this book's about a Mennonite colony and there has been this really tragic, violent event that has happened. Women have been waking up and they have been covered in blood and their bodies are in pain and they are gathering together or some of the women are gathering together to try and figure out how to deal with the men that have caused this violence within their community. And the way that Taze has chosen to like tell this story is so great. So the narrator is a man named August Epp. So he kind of discusses about who he is and his relationship to the community. He was born in the community, left the community, came back to the community and the women trust him. And he is like taking the, the minutes for their meeting, essentially. So the women gather together and they're discussing what should we do about this violence? How should we go forward? And he is recounting the story. And it's done so well. Each character, each woman that sits in that circle and discusses things, their character is so well rounded, even though you're only kind of getting reported back what they've said through this guy that's sitting taking the minutes. Um, yeah, I really, really loved these women. It was a lot of questioning each other and thinking about what the community's values are and what personal values are and what should be held highest, like what the community says as a whole with these roles and rules that have been written by these men or what these women are feeling and what they think is best given that there has been violence against them. And there's a lot of beautiful philosophical tangents that kind of veer off down different roads. And yeah, I just thought that this was a gorgeous book. I loved it. Obviously, be mindful going into it because there is a lot of uh, discussion of like quite extreme violence towards women. Um, and this book is also being adapted into a film. I think it stars Rooney Mara, Claire Foy. Frances McDormand. Yeah, I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to seeing that too. Then I read The English Understand Wool by Helen DeWitt. This was a tasty, tiny little snack. Um, very, very, very slim. I think it's like 69 pages or 70 pages, something like that. And it is about the relationship between a mother and daughter and um, private life and public life and because it's so small and it really goes off in a direction that you don't expect it to I don't want to give too much away um, but if you like to read um, for interesting character then I would say that this book is maybe a good pick for you I know that a lot of people really really love this book a lot of people whose tastes I share or admire like really enjoyed this and I have to say that I enjoyed it too. I don't think I like loved it, but I did enjoy it. And then I did another audiobook. I've been like, the first part of the year, I did a few audios, which I don't do that often, um, but I listened to Public Library by Ali Smith and it was Ali Smith herself reading it, which was like really comforting to hear just a nice Scottish voice. Um, and this was a collection of short stories and it all really shines through about how much Smith loves books, loves writing, loves libraries, loves words. It was very enjoyable. She is a wordsmith. She is amazing with words. 
um, super tongue-in-cheek, super playful, um, really witty, really great imagery. But yeah, this is a, like a love letter, a collection of love letters about why books, reading, writing and words are like so important. I followed that up with another Ally Smith. I read Girl Meets Boy and this is my favourite Smith that I've read so far. So last year I read Hotel World and I didn't love the book but I loved her writing. I don't know if that makes sense but um, I definitely, this is my favourite um, Ally Smith so far, so far. I want to read the quartet so much but I want to do it like in time with the seasons and I think autumn's the first one so I've got to wait a little while before I can jump into those. In Smith fashion she really takes on questioning uh, gender norms, she really questions um, heteronormative expectations, she questions capitalism, commercialization, globalization, and she does it all within this really fun imagery filled story and yeah this was so, so good. Um, it also has like the best sex scene that I've ever read. Yeah I feel like this book definitely has my favorite sex scene. It was just really interesting, really beautiful, and really hot. I am like struggling to like get my words together today. Um, I do feel like I'm much better at communicating uh, written rather than verbally. Um, but what I'm loving about Smith's books that I've read so far, especially Hotel World and Girl Meets Boy, is how she talks about desire because I feel like Smith just takes her um, description of desire into this like really unconventional realm and I love it so much. Um, let me see, do I have any, do I have any examples of what I'm speaking about? Maybe this page where I have like all these markings on it. But I stared at my grandparents in their photo with their arms around each other and their heads together and I wish that my own bones were unbound. I wish that they were mingling, picked clean by fish with the bones of another body, a body my bones and heart and soul had loved with unfathomable certainty for decades, and both of us down deep now, lost to everything but the fact of bare bones on a dark seabed. Like, that's so beautiful. Like, she wants to love somebody so much that their history is them ending up on the floor of the ocean, just bones, their carcasses being picked away at by fish, but their bones are mingled together and entangled because they've loved each other for so much for so long. I actually wrote something about it, so let me see if I can find that and express what I'm trying to say better. We need the glasses. I was writing about how Smith uses this like unconventional and vivid imagery with like poignant symbolism to express desire in young women. It was about Hotel World and Girl Meets Boy. Let me see. Okay. Death is again an unlikely visual accompaniment to illustrate a young woman's yearning, yet Smith uses it to powerful effect in Girl Meets Boy. Anthea wonders what she wants from life. And I wish that my own bones were unbound. I wish that they were mingling, picked clean by fish. Here, Anthea is lost in her thoughts, trying to figure out who she is now that she's back home. Her thoughts unspool in a poetic stream of consciousness, brimming with imagery. The peculiar choice of the image of her body beneath the water, picked down to the bones by fish, holds poignancy concerning what Anthea wants deep down. Love, connection and freedom. The word unbound symbolises her feelings towards her current state of being. She feels trapped and longs for liberation. The sense of captivity spills out of her thoughts and into her physicality as she muses about her identity. I sat down on the kitchen floor. I traced a square in the parquet with my finger. Her thoughts are sprawling, but the feeling of overwhelm becomes apparent in her physical body. She feels boxed in. Smith directly shows her reader the trapped feeling society's boundaries can produce. Yeah, like, imagine just like wanting to be a carcass at the bottom of the sea with the person that you love like that to me that is like a oh, deep love like that is why <laughs> instead of it being like all like pretty and like tied up with a bow it's like unconventional and it's weird and it's a bit grotesque but it it like works so much better later in the novel anthea's lover robin tells her the myth of iphis and ianth so that's 
Ovid's Metamorphosis that this story is based on. Anthea interrupts to ask, did their hearts hurt? Did they think that they were underwater all the time? Did they feel scoured by light? Did they wander about not knowing what to do with themselves? The word choice is severe and consuming. And then oh, I've quoted Mary Riffle here, so that's, that's a nice like callback. Um, Riffle's notion that direct obvious imitation often produces a sterile imitation explains the effectiveness of Smith's imagery. Her writing unearths and creates mimetic sensations of desire without being cliche. And then, a lovemaking scene between Anthea and Robin, which is so hot, is written as a series of images, morphing and mutating with each move and moment between them. I was sinew, I was snake, I changed stone to snake in three simple moves, stoke, snake, stake. Were our hands black shining hooves? Were we kicking? Were we bitten? Were our heads locked into each other to the death? This language, again, subverts the traditional and commercialized visuals of love and summons forth the mingling and unbound bones that Anthea yearns to become. She wants to merge, transform, and push the boundaries of what love can feel and look like. Smith captures the fluid nature of desire through girl meets boy, and this scene exemplifies its transformative power. So yeah, if you're like me, and you love love, and you love desire, and you love just like mm, wanting to like, be entangled with something because you love it so much you want to merge with it then like girl meets boy is a really good book for that <laughs> so then i read what we talk about when we talk about love by raymond carver and um, we read that for my book club and had a, a really good chat about it afterwards um it's a collection of short stories it is very well known and i'd wanted to read it for a long time and something inside me was like save it for book club and so i did and i'm really glad i did because we had a really good chat about it um so carver i'd never read any of carver's work before but he writes in this style of like dirty realism he looks at the he looks at things with a lens that is not clouded with any kind of romanticism it's not lyrical, it's not trying to make things uh, look, feel, sound nice, it's just very, very, very um, real. And there's like a melancholy tone that follows each of these stories and the prose is so like economical, like it is sparse and it feels like there's a lot of breathing space around the words that he's using and even though the stories might be inc incredibly short, because of the way that he writes and the kind of breathing space around his stories, I felt my brain like filling in the gaps itself and it, it not like clouding things, but just like filling things out in a way that made sense. Like he only had to say so much for me to like understand. And like, I just really enjoyed that kind of change of pace of writing. Like it's very sparse uh, writing, but it says a lot. Um, there is one story that's a conversation between um, a father and a son and they're in an airport and the kind of uh, awkwardness that's in that dialogue is amazing. Um, these two men can't say what they want to say and you just feel, like feel the strain and the tension in them like trying to just be civil and have these niceties when there's like a whole relationship underneath all of that um yeah i found found it really really good um my favorite story i think was so much water so close to home um yeah if you've read that i would love to know what your favorite story within the collection is um the title story what we talk about when we talk about love is obviously incredible as well and yeah i feel like Carver's really speaking about the kind of like unsaid, unnamed aspects of love rather than the like really obvious, enjoyable parts that everybody wants to talk about. Um, he's focusing his lens on the more unsavory aspects of love, I guess. And then I read my first Surrey Hustvet and I felt my life change. I found a new writer that I am completely obsessed with. I read her um, essay collection, Mothers, Fathers and Others, and it was 
incredible. Like I kept just like wanting to stop what I was doing and like just go back to reading it because it was so, so good. It was incredibly thoughtful, incredibly intelligent and just like covered all of my favorite things within essays, like within any writing. Um, she's speaking about um, families, relationships, the boundaries within them, the love and the hate within them, speaking about art, philosophy, being a writer, being a woman, being a mother, and how all of these things come together and can be contained within one person. Um, there's a really great essay on um, Wuthering Heights um, by Emily Bronte. There's a really really good essay that actually made me cry about her relationship with her mother that was just incredibly incredibly touching and she speaks about the best advice that she ever received in life was from her mother and it was something along the lines of remember you don't have to do anything you don't really want to do her mother was seeing her as a teenager as a you know coming into her own, making her own decisions and was respecting her as her own person. Like, you don't have to do something if you don't really want to do it. And that's kind of giving agency to her daughter. That's like, okay, I know that you're a person and I kind of hope and respect that you would know right from wrong. And you know that you're, you know your own values and your own morals and you know to stand up for yourself, you know to stand up for others. And I just thought it was like, oh, that essay was just really, really beautiful. It was kind of written as um, she reflected on her mother's life. Her mother sadly died and she spoke about a walk that she took with her mother and then she spoke about her mother's life and um, yeah, gorgeous. And then there was a really good essay on uh, Louise Bourgeois' work um, and about how she didn't become an artist until she was older and the kind of dynamics that were in play um, within her family life and then her uh, marriage and oh god yeah it was a while ago I read it now but I absolutely ate it up. I loved every moment with that book. Then I read Lucy by Jamaica Kincaid and was completely bowled over, won over by her protagonist Lucy. Um, this was my first Kincaid and it was thoroughly enjoyable. It was really speedy, really quick. I devoured it in an afternoon. A young woman who's moving from um, her island life, her family life, um, everything she's known in the West Indies to North America to become an au pair to a very rich family. And yeah, she is quick-witted. She is searingly honest. She is just so funny, so... Um, just feels really, uh, like, so believable as a character. And... I really enjoyed my time with her and um, she's kind of examining where she fits in within life in uh, North America, life within the class that she's been slotted into with this family, life within that family and where her loyalties lie and figuring out what her identity is, what she likes, what she dislikes, um, figuring out love and desire and friendships and yeah, it was a very small book, but it was just so, so enjoyable. It was like razor sharp. I feel like Lucy as a character is like disarmingly honest and unknowingly like really witty. And yeah, she was someone that I wish that I was friends with when I was like her age, like 19. Yeah, she has this confidence about her that made me think she has to be an Aries, like she's fiery and confident and oh god, I, one of my favourite protagonists I have ever met, I've got to say. Then we had some more poetry, read more Ocean Vuong, read his debut collection, Night Sky with Exit Wounds and again loved it. Um, this cover, this collection covers a lot, so there's a lot of like war and conflict in family history, there's um, cultural upheaval, you know, moving, his family moving to a new place and finding like where they fit in within this new location. And there's a lot of love and loss, grief and desire, um, happiness and sorrow, and like these massive, massive themes that can seem 
some of them like universal like love loss desire sorrow grief all these things but making them like incredibly intimate and so personal and then putting that on paper and like reading it like it was like very affecting very moving if you haven't read ocean form yet i don't know what you've been doing i read on earth were briefly gorgeous a few years ago now and it really like it really changed me in some way just seeing like such beautiful beautiful writing about such real heavy harrowing things ocean form is just really something special <laughs> um and i've said this on a couple of videos before but the way that he speaks about how we use the english language and how violent a language it is very interesting um there's a i've recommended it before but there's an amazing interview with him on the on being podcast where he speaks about that i will try to remember to link it below but i think i've recommended that to everyone so if you haven't listened to it yet please do it's incredible then i read my first tony morrison and oh my god um actually this has been quite a good like year for reading so far but reading my first tony morrison was an experience so I actually buddy read this with uh, Nathan and I feel like that like elevated my experience somewhat because Nathan is a really intelligent reader. He was asking the most thoughtful, curious, intelligent questions and it was making me like think deeper about my like perception of this novel, like what I got from it, what and like there was just like this deep level of um, like appreciation for discussing books with someone that I haven't had in a long time. Anyway, the book. Um, we have our title character, Sula, and uh, Nell, and the story revolves around these two young girls and how they grow up and grow apart. So they're from the same community. Oh, another good book if you love community's character, like 100%. So these two young girls um, from very different families and how when they come together, it's almost like they balance each other out into like one person that functions well. And then when they're apart, it is the extremes. We have Sula, who is like the walking expression of feeling, emotion, passion. There's a quote about how she's an artist without an art and how that can be so dangerous because where is she going to um where is she going to channel all of this passion and energy that she has? Um then you have Nell who has been completely kind of like tightly laced up by her mother to be what a woman should be, should uh look for a husband, should be a mother, and um, you know, she presses down her feelings so much that when something very upsetting and shocking happens to her in the book she cannot summon herself to like feel or express any of the emotion and like that really hit me it was very moving um there is a lot of very clever symbolism very very effective imagery i don't understand why i hadn't read tony morrison sooner like i know it's because i didn't know where to start and i was so intimidated by her work because I knew it was going to be good. I knew it was going to like make me feel a lot of things and I didn't really know where to start. But oh my god, I've been missing out. Like if you haven't read any Toni Morrison yet, you really are missing out. And Sula was a great place to start. I loved it so much. Then I read Another Tiny Little Baby, Exposure by Olivia Sujic. And this is an essay about anxiety. It's an essay about auto fiction written by women and it's an essay about um the internet and feminism and the private self and the public self and as someone who really does suffer from anxiety to the degree where it can be like debilitating f for my life i felt very um it was like very validating reading this. It was quite reassuring. So Jake uses her love of books and of writers almost as like, she uses the word talismans and they like, these talismans like 
keep her going, keep reminding her that her doing her work, even though it does put her out there to be seen, to be perceived, to be judged, like it's worth it. Like she's doing something that is worth it. Um, there's a really interesting point about Elena Ferrante and how obviously that is her pen name, that is not her actual name. She wants this anonymity, she doesn't want to be known and I have a deep respect for her for that. Um, there's, I think there's a lot of anger out there that people aren't satisfied with the art and the work that she produces. They want to know the writer, they want to know the artist, they want to know the person and they feel almost entitled to know that person. And that's like quite a scary thing. I turned up a lot of pages in here. There's a lot of good stuff. Um, there actually aren't enough cliches for finding relief in words. Usually I find it in other people's, but sometimes also in trying to select the right ones of my own. On the rare occasions I manage to successfully communicate what I'm trying to say, it feels as if an equilibrium between outside and inside has been reached. My ears finally pop. But while writing can contribute to a feeling of unreality, going mad, reading others' outpourings usually has the opposite effect. The more I read by the women I admire, and I retreat into those talisman texts to reorient myself every time I need to, the more I think of anxiety as a dual force that seems essential, not just for living, but for creativity. So good. Okay, yeah, this is, a really, this is a really good bit too. Like most people, I read not only to encounter difference, but to find communion, to feel as if my inner life and the authors have briefly merged, to find skinlessness communicated on paper. It reassures me that if I occasionally feel the bubble of my mind slip from the spirit level of sanity, the normal I like to think of as me, so do a lot of other people I admire. The talismans reassure me that anxiety drives so much of the art that makes me feel most alive. I feel like that's true for me too. Um, a lot of the art and writing that I love, there is an anxiety behind it. There is an anxiety that is like prevalent and that makes me feel a little bit more sane than I usually do. And then after that, I went back to some Siri Husvet and I read uh, What I Loved, which is a novel and I cherished every single moment I had with this book. It follows, um, we have our protagonist who is an art history professor and we follow his life from when he meets his wife, they meet in an academic library, like what a meet cute. It tells the story of their relationship to them marrying, to them having a child. It also follows his friendship with an artist who ends up living in the same building as him. Um, there's a lot of the New York art scene within this book. There's a lot of um, academia, painting, there's a lot of writing, there's a lot of performance art. Um, so I really, really loved the world that this novel was set within. I mean, I've never been to New York, but I'm pretty sure I'd love it. <laughs> and I think mostly what I got from this book was um, how relationships like evolve over time and they become different as we become different people and the p people that we're in relationships with, they become different people and therefore our relationship to them becomes different. And like, how do you deal with that? How do you cope with that? Um, it was incredible. I loved this book. I enjoyed every moment I had with it. I was looking forward to getting back to it. Um, I would definitely recommend it if you like a cast of characters. I'd recommend it if you want a book set in New York, if you want a book that incorporates the art scene. I feel like I've definitely been reading more plotty books, more plot heavy books than No Plot Just Vibes just now. And you know, I'm fine with that. I'm just going with it, going with whatever I'm enjoying when I'm reading it. But yes, um, probably one of my favorite novels now. I absolutely loved it. So I got Curse Brad by Sophie McIntosh the day that it was published, um, which is unusual for me. I'm not usually jumping on to um, like freshly published books as soon as they come out, but I really love Sophie McIntosh's writing and I was really, really, really excited for this book. It is very loosely based on true events that happened in the 1950s in a small town in France. And let me just say that 
for most of the book, Macintosh isn't telling you what's going on. She is painting a picture with the senses. Everything, like everything is so fully rendered. And I, this book really looks at desire and how desire is such a driving force, but how it can also be the thing that like, sends everything to hell. It can be the thing that unravels everything because people can desire anything, but it also looks at, um, you know, the power dynamic within couples, especially at that time when you have like, um, you know, heterosexual couples with the husband of the house and then the wife of the house and how a lot of the characters are only named as like the grocer's wife or something like that. Like it becomes your entire identity. So it makes sense that you would be really strongly desiring something out with that, something that would maybe tear that all to shreds. And yeah, there's like a lot of, there's a lot of desire like tainted with danger throughout this book. I felt a bit woozy. I felt a bit nauseous. It was like, well, anything could happen and I don't really know what's gonna happen. And yeah, it was very, hypnotic, mesmerizing, lyrical. It was really, really, really good. Would recommend. And the last book that I read in March was another essay collection. It was Thin Places by Jordan Kisner. And before I get onto how much I love this collection, I love this cover, but also it's like, it's not matte and it's not glossy. It's like this perfect in between place and it's like slightly textured and it has the right like flop to it it's just a gorgeous book as a physical object um but yes i love jordan kissner's writing um she has a podcast actually called thresholds which is one of my favorite podcasts there's a lot of incredibly thoughtful interviews with writers and artists i will link it below because really like deep deep conversations about um, the thresholds within the artist's life where they crossed over and it brought them to something new. Anyway, this collection covers a lot. Um, covers spirituality, covers um, identity, covers cultures clashing, covers history, covers uh, death. There was a lot, um, but every single essay was incredibly enjoyable. How you can access that feeling of spirituality, how you can access that kind of, um, that reverence through nature, through music, through relationships, um, through yourself. Um, and then there was an essay, I think, was it the last one? No, second last essay, I think. And it was about um, death investigators, the people that turn upon the scene after a death has occurred and they kind of deduce by the clues around what has happened to the person. Um, and how she went to their offices to speak to them about their job and you hear about how much like care and dedication these people give to you know usher dead people from this life into the next and like it was quite morbid but like really gorgeous um, and just speaking about how being around a corpse being around a a dead body, um, a cadaver, I guess, in this case, and how being in the same room as a dead body, a cadaver, being in the same room as something that doesn't have life in it anymore, really makes you think about life and death, like, a lot. <laughs> and, yeah, makes you appreciate what you have whilst you have it, but also makes you way more scared of things that you didn't really realize that you had to be scared of um, and kind of pulls you closer to the people in your life. Um, yeah, I think everyone should read this. If you're looking for like a good essay collection, read this or Suri Hustvet's Mother, Fathers and Others because those two essay collections are, in I love a good essay collection and they, oh, they really did it for me. From time to time, you'll hear a writer suggest that we're all cursed, like Kierkegaard, to tell the same story over and over, forever. Maggie Nelson suggests, less morosely, that we may undergo the same realizations, write the same notes in the margin, return to the same themes in one's work, relearn the same emotional truths. 
not because we're cursed or stuck, but because in fact, such revisitations constitute a life. Read that essay collection, listen to her podcast. I am a lover of Jordan Kisner, big time. <laughs> That's everything I read from January to March, 24 books in three months, which is definitely fine. I would love to know if you've read any of these and what your thoughts are, but also like what your favorite read has been this year so far. Like what is something you read this year and you were like, whoa, I can't believe I hadn't read this before. I was missing out because I've had a few of those for sure. Definitely with a Toni Morrison, like Sula, wow. How have I not read that before? Anyway, um, yeah, I would love to know what you've read this year so far. But yeah, I think that's everything. So I missed you. Thank you so much for showing up even though I definitely was not around. <laughs> Thank you to the um, people who sent me really lovely messages um, saying that you missed my videos and um, were hoping for some more. Like, I hear you, I see you, I'm just um, trying to get my chaotic life together to sit down in front of a camera. It's very difficult. <laughs> Um, but it's worth it. I love chatting to you about books. So I will hopefully see you again very, very soon.